his book, O.J. Simpson says that he would have taken a bullet or stood in front of a train for Nicole. Man, I'm going to tell you, that is some bad luck when the one guy who would have died for you kills you. That's kind of a... <laughs> that is kind of unfortunate, isn't it? What are the odds? Seems improbable. Womp, womp, womp. Yeah, slash to the left, slash to the right. O.J. Simpson is headed downfield. Cancer murders O.J. Simpson. You know, he was in uh, the Naked Gun movies. He was a big Hollywood hit. He was in Naked Gun, 33 and a third, a Naked Gun, two and a half, The Smell of Fear. He was in the Towering Inferno before he was doing comedy. Then he had to stop doing comedy after he decapitated Nicole Nicole Brown, the mother of his children, because people didn't think he was that funny anymore. (laughs) And Ron Goldman, the waiter who was just innocently bringing home, what was it, reading glasses? Uh, Left something, she left something at the restaurant, and he was just bringing them home, which is what waiters always do in Los Angeles. They drive to your house to drop off your, and uh, then it's perfectly normal. Everything was fine there, but O.J., turns out he was a little jealous. He had kind of some jealousy issues and didn't turn out well for anyone, did it? No, it really didn't. But that Bronco, the white Bronco, and Al Cowlings, and you know who this is? G.D. it, and all that stuff, that was uh, the wildest just talking to Bill Hess about this, and it's like, oh, I remember the bar I was in watching the low-speed chase. Uh, again, the uh, the NBA championship was going on that night, the championship game, and and uh, eventually everybody had to say, well, forget about that NBA game. I, I know that was a big deal a minute ago, but here's O.J. Simpson driving at 20 miles an hour on the highway in Los Angeles, California, with 500 police cars chasing him at 20 miles an hour. It was kind of peculiar. And his pal, Al Al Cowlings, is on the phone with the police uh, telling us all about it. 911, what are you reporting? This is is AC. I have OJ in the car. Okay, where are you? Please, I'm coming up the 5 freeway. Okay. Right now, we all are okay, but you got to tell the police to just back off. He's still alive, but he got a gun to his head. Is everything else okay? Everything right now is okay, officer. Everything is okay. All about he wants to get me to get it to his mom. He wants me to get it to his house. Okay. So that's all I that's all we ask. He got a gun to his head. Okay, and what what's your name? My name is AC. You know who I am, damn it. You know who I am? It's AC. You figure the whole world knows him. He's AC. Uh AC Al, Al Cowlings. And uh, the whole world didn't know who he was. He was, he was a legend in his own mind. Uh, he became famous then. That's the thing that he's most famous for is that moment there. And O.J.'s got a gun to his head. He's going to kill himself. Uh, you know what? Oh, boy. stand back, man. I think he means it. He's holding himself hostage. He was. It's a hostage situation. Who's holding who hostage? Uh, O.J. Simpson. Which one is O.J. Simpson? He's both. I'm sorry, what? He's the hostage taker, and he's the hostage. He's got a gun to his own head, and he's taking himself hostage. And he's... Uh, uh, driving actually, Al Cowlings was driving the uh, the uh, the vehicle, but that was just the wildest. It was, and it was it was impossible to believe because he was a naked gun, thirty three and a third. He was, it was the smell of fear. He was in the towering inferno. He was O.J. Simpson. He was a, a national hero from the time he was about eighteen or nineteen years old. Everybody knew him. He was a household name. Ornthal. Ornthal's not a real name, is it? It's just Ornthal. James, that's a real name. Amazing stuff. Yes, sir. O.J. Simpson. Dead and gone. And it was. We were uh, joking. It was like the uh, Blazing Saddles, you know, Blazing Saddles. The Mel Brooks classic. Uh, Cleavon Little held himself hostage, too, when uh, the people in the little town were looking askance at him. And he uh, put a gun to his own head and uh, threatened to kill himself uh, so that he could escape. And that's what O.J. was doing, a lot like Blazing Saddles that day. That was amazing. I remember the bar that I was in, too. I was in the Irish Times down on Capitol Hill. 
when we uh, got word and the basketball game was on and everybody started getting word, hey, uh, something going on, because we already knew that O.J. Simpson's wife had been murdered and the waiter, Ron Goldman, um, and, uh, and then, you know, and that O.J. was maybe a suspect because who else would be? And everybody was, oh, no, I hope that's not true. And then we got word, uh-oh, O.J.'s fleeing the cops. He's in a white Bronco, and he's on I-5, and he's driving 20 miles an hour, which will get you a ticket in California for impeding traffic because that's going slow, going too slow. Maybe our uh, caller from earlier today, Rob, would say that the police had no business pulling him over. <laughs> Isn't anybody going to help that poor man? He's got a gun to his own head. <laughs> I think he means it. <laughs> Back up, boys, I think he means it. That's amazing. All right, I have uh, OJ. Uh, we just got word on the OJ death, so had to, had to pause there. And I've got to get back to my uh, mailbag because I, I have been remiss once again. Let's go to uh, the next question. And uh, the last one was, should government employee use as FISA to spy on we, the people, be fired, stripped of their pension, all government benefits, and imprisoned to hard labor? The answer is, if they're doing it illegally and it's not legitimate, and it's uh, for political reasons, which is what we've seen again and again. And, and again, I was talking about the, uh, played some Donald Trump audio talking about how they spied on him, used the, and abused the FISA courts to spy on him. And it's true because the Democrats are filthy corrupt. And the Democrats still lie on the news media. That includes the news media. They still lie. Oh, they did not spy on Trump. The FBI and the Department of Justice conduct court-ordered electronic surveillance. I have never thought of that as spying. Yeah, it's the FISA court. <laughs> Idiot. Lion Sacagawea. That was, of course, James Comey, who lied a lot and is a crook and was not held accountable, but went off to make millions of dollars because of corrupt Democrats that love corruption. And because it's America, they have lots of money. Free market capitalism. Free to steal like the media, free and fair press, free to be unfair. But the Heritage Foundation published a piece January 30th of 2020, warrants to spy on Trump campaign lacked probable cause, DOJ admits. And uh, this is a, a great piece that I went and found by Cully Sim- Stimson, Cully Stimson, uh, Charles Cully Stimson wrote the piece in 2020. Turns out the FBI and Justice Department did abuse the FISA process, omit material information, and subvert justice, and the DOJ has now admitted it. This forthright admission by the Department of Justice cuts against the story concocted by the Democrats about the legal merits of the Russia investigation. The FBI identified multiple corrective actions it said it is taking and will undertake to make sure this doesn't happen again. You gang of criminals. It's like catching children stealing stuff. Oh, we've taken corrective action and, uh, and it won't happen again. You filthy criminals, you corrupted our presidential elections. More than one of them, by the way. The FBI and the intelligence community and and uh, Barack Obama with his communist mentor, Frank Marshall Davis, and his Saul Alinsky teachings. And, and then, of course, the CIA director and Communist Party voter, John Brennan. You know, I say this stuff and people say, oh, he's just making that stuff. It's just rhetoric. None of that is just rhetoric. All of that is verifiable and confessed truth. So two of the FBI's four applications for warrants under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act to spy on Trump's campaign and his campaign advisor, who was a Naval Academy grad, George Papadopoulos, lacked probable cause and should not have been issued in the first place. We later learned that the other two warrants were equally corrupt. And that's all okay. So, uh, yeah, those people, Michael asks, yeah, those people should be facing prison time. They should be stripped of their government pensions and all government benefits. And, yes, they should go to prison. Yes, that's a mailbag question from Michael. 
Matthew Lorber. Excuse me, Matthew Lorder. No? Dyslexia kicks in again. Matthew Lorber. Do you think the Democrats launch a coup against Biden and his handlers before the Democratic convention? I call it a coup deliberately because if they want to, if they wanted to replace him, they should have announced an open nomination process last summer. They replace him now, it's a coup. Now, I've been saying all along that I believe that Joe Biden will not be the nominee come election day. The closer we get to election day, the less likely that becomes. But let me say, I'm still waiting for the Democrats to pull Joe Biden for one reason or another. We have this Joe Biden audio where he says that he'll fake an illness and uh, when the day comes, you know, if there's some kind of a dispute and he's babbling incoherently, and then he explains how he could fake an illness and he'll step aside as president. And he was talking about as vice president at the time and running. Uh, but I still think the Democrats want to replace him. And he's doing badly with uh, Latinx voters, as Joe Biden calls Latinos, because they don't believe in gender anymore because they're all mentally ill. And... Um, and Joe Biden said this. When we disagree, it'll be just like, so far, it's been just like when Barack and I did. If, if, if I reach something where there's a, a fundamental disagreement we have based on a moral principle, I'll, uh, I'll, 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 I'll develop some disease and say I have to resign. Yeah, well, I keep waiting for, you know, because he does sleep in an iron lung and uh, he's uh, intubated at night. And he does have that CPAP machine and, and stuff. That's a little different, I guess. But... Do you think the Democrats launched coup against Biden and his handlers before the Democratic convention? Maybe at the Democratic convention. But I think once we get close, Joe Biden's political future is very much in jeopardy. I think they're very angry that he's doing badly with African-American voters, especially African-American men, doing badly with uh, Latinx voters, who he calls Latinx voters. Um, And they're worried that he's going to lose. And it's the end of democracy, end of the world if he loses So they're willing to go to extreme measures, very extreme measures. These are extremists that are running the party, not just political extremists, social, cultural extremists. And Joe Biden is very much in danger. Donald Trump is very much in danger every day as well. But he has a different set of issues uh, that uh, confront him and his security team. And would it be a coup? Well, it would be kind of inside the rules of politics, But they don't care about the rules. They'll bend the rules. They'll shatter shatter the rules. uh, And they don't care about the rule of law either. They'll do what they want. And who knows what will happen to Joe Biden. But come election day, will Joe Biden be the nominee on the ballot? Maybe. And maybe not. Now, Todd Austin asks, last question from the mailbag, when and how did you learn to fly? That's kind of a a trick question, a little bit of a trick question, I think, because I'm not a licensed pilot, Um, but I have had the opportunity to fly an F-16 and an F-18. The F-16, I really got to fly the pants off of out of Moody Air Force Base in Georgia with the 69th Fighter Squadron and a then Air Force Captain Gary Bell who was in the front seat when I was in the back seat. And let me tell you, it's just uh, it's just human nature to be able to fly an F-16. Throttle in the left hand, stick in the right hand, uh, you know, punch it to just below the breaking the sound barrier, pull the stick back and do a 7.5G loop and then uh, spin out of it and go into an, uh, a spiral climbing in the sky and then stall and, and go nose down. Uh, pretty easy stuff. F-18, I got to do some aileron rolls and other things, but didn't have as much fun as the F-16. And they didn't teach me how to fly it. They just said, well, get in the plane. This is the throttle. That's the stick. Figure it out. I said, okay. And it was pretty easy, I got to say. I flew a helicopter once, too. A little more complicated. F-16, much easier. And F-16, much more comfortable than an F-18 also. Not to. But I'm not a licensed pilot. Although, you know, if I were a billionaire, I'd have two F-16s so my friends and I could go flying. I'll tell you that much. 
you know, baseball season has started. You notice that? And that puts us right in the middle of tax season. My best girl and I were talking about taxes this morning over breakfast. That was not good. You know, you've heard the horror stories. They, they never end well, IRS stories. So let me tell you about my friends at Legal Tax Defense. If you have unfiled back taxes or you owe the IRS $10,000 or more, then it's time to call the legal experts at Legal Tax Defense. They have a team of attorneys, tax attorneys, and legal professionals that will help guide you through the complicated tax codes and, and your legal troubles before they become big legal troubles. The IRS recently announced their increasing collection activity for the 2023 tax year. And, uh, you know, the, the deadline is looming large right now. With former IRS tax attorneys and expert tax professionals, Legal Tax Defense is gearing up for this increased IRS activity to help protect you. So call them today. Don't procrastinate. They're at 800-472-0467. Take advantage of tax relief programs like the Fresh Start Program. Call now to get qualified for your tax relief options. Call the experts at Tax Relief Excuse me, at Legal Tax Defense now. Legal Tax Defense. The call's confidential and it's free. The number is 800-472-0467. Find them online at LegalTaxDefense.com. Yes, sir. We got a lot going on today, don't we? Yes, we do. Yeah, but I did love my F-16 day. I still got to find Gary Bell. He became a lieutenant colonel. Then I lost track of him. I owe him a steak dinner and lots of drinks. Hey, it's Chris Plant. Excited to tell you about our July 2024 Listener Sea Cruise. We'll be sailing around the British Isles, visiting Scotland and Ireland. Please join us. Visit ChrisPlantCruise.com. I don't really have time enough to go to a telephone call just yet, but we got a little more, uh, a little more OJ. Uh, the New York Times on O.J. <laughs> and it's all our fault, it turns out, that uh, O.J. is an indictment. Uh, his life story is an indictment of the United States of America and everyone in it because they're the news media and they're mentally ill. That's the thing. Um, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, the Air Force captain that I went flying an F-16 with, 69th Fighter Squadron, out of Moody Air Force Base, in South Georgia, Valdosta, Georgia, the sound of freedom. And uh, Gary Bell, Gary Bell, fighter pilot, his call sign was Tinker. You know, Tinker Bell, because it's a funny call sign. Why is your call sign Tinker? You just point at your name patch on your chest. Come on, I'm Tinker Bell. Try to keep up, please. Got that and your calls coming up. OJ really stepped on my mailbag, didn't he? It's not as bad as what he did to Nicole Brown or to Ron Goldman. But still, thinking maybe we'll have a uh, a procession of white Broncos doing a, uh, a low-speed funeral procession. Of course, funeral processions are usually not high-speed. Maybe it'd be funny now to have a high-speed. Yeah, have a... Uh, a uh, cavalcade of 1980s white Broncos for the OJ funeral procession on I-5. Just, uh, just crazy. Yes, sir. The New York Times says that as uh, a jury in the murder trial, which held a cracked mirror up to black and white America. What? What is that? I'm sorry, the OJ Simpson... Uh, multi-millionaire, world-famous superstar athlete and movie star, murdered his wife. His wife was white. I don't think I've mentioned that the whole... <laughs> I always uh, screw that up. I forget to racialize everything like the Democrats. O.J. was black for Democrats listening along. And, and his wife uh, was white, and Ron Goldman was white too. And then they were uh, butchered by O.J. Simpson, who did it. Uh, but it didn't... You know, it held up a cracked mirror to black and white America... Sure. What, like, uh, what? Well, there was, uh, you know, the, the scenes when the verdict came down. 
Room full of black people cheered at not guilty. Room full of white people couldn't believe it and walked out slowly when found not guilty. It was quite a moment, it really was, in, in American cultural history. Well, it is finally official. Murder is legal in the state of California. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, then, uh, then there were a lot of jokes that came out of it, too, because what are you going to do? Uh, O.J. had already murdered her. And Cato Kalin became famous. He kind of lived in O.J.'s house for no apparent reason, and uh, I don't know what he did. Uh, errands and things like that. That was a weird situation. Crazy. And then a uh, civil suit filed by the families of uh, Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman. They sued O.J. Simpson, and in 1997, then, uh, you know, the whole thing was in 1995, and then in 1997, he was found guilty in a civil trial of killing them. But, you know, you don't go to jail for that. They ordered him to pay $33.5 million. And he didn't pay an awful lot of that to the families, but they got to roust him. Then in 2006, he sold a book which was titled cleverly, If I Did It. If I Did It. And it's about, no, if I did it, it would have been much smarter. I wouldn't have cut my glove and I wouldn't have left my Bruno Mali shoe prints all over the place. And and I wouldn't have gotten caught. Yeah, that's what he's saying. But he did. And it was this, uh, there was this racial divide in the country. Uh, guilty, not guilty. Obviously, he was guilty. There was never any doubt that he was guilty. But Johnny Cochran, the lawyer, was just one of the great lawyers, I got to tell you. He made a guilty man into an innocent man uh, in the eyes of at least you know one juror, which is all you need. And he won the case. It was amazing. Just amazing. And there's a great miniseries on this. What's it called then? Made in the USA? Or? No, not that one. That's a stupid one. No, no, but the, uh, the miniseries with uh, all the actors. And so, it's, I'll think of it. In a, um, oh, it's The People versus O.J. The People versus O.J. Simpson. I don't know what it's on. If it's on anything. It's FX, so it's on Hulu. Yeah. It was just one of the great miniseries of all. If you were around and paying attention then, uh, which everybody was. All right, let's go to the telephones, Michael. Let's go to let's go to Marvin calling from Chesapeake, Virginia. Marv, you're on the Chris Plant Show. Hello, Chris. How you doing? Very well, Marvin. What do you say? What do you know? Oh man, I I I, I didn't know. I was in the I was in a store when uh, I heard about OJ. So uh, I'm like you, you know the. It's amazing how the New York Times and all these people, all of the uh, the ingrates or the people who are criminals like Floyd and, and O.J. Simpson, they hold them up as martyrs. You know, and I think that has just been some of the worst things I've ever seen in my entire life. And I knew he was guilty. I'm one of those blacks that wasn't cheering for this guy because I knew he did it. So uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I That wasn't what a... Initially, I was calling about. I was calling call let you know that you were a stud, man. I'm I'm a vet, and I you were telling me about all these planes and things that you were flying. I was just, I was just, it was that's amazing. You you were a stud. <laughs> well, I got it. it's a piece man. of cake. You're you're a veteran. You ever you ever fly in any tactical aircraft? I never tried to fly. I jumped out a lot of airplanes, though. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. All right. So you're Army Airborne. <laughs> Airborne Ranger. Is that right? No kidding. All right. God bless you. Yep. Yep. Man. And I went to ranger school when I was 36 years old. Cut it out. Are you kidding me? Man, you're twice the age. You're like Colonel Kurtz in Apocalypse Now. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I was just, I, 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 I I was, I was working at the Pentagon just like you. And, uh, I, you know, I, I was calling a lot when, uh, when I was up there, when I was working up there, but, uh, I haven't been able to get you for a while because uh, you're so you know you're so popular, but man, I had no idea of, about your military career. So, my hats off to you. I give you a, a salute, and uh, if I ever see you, I'm gonna buy you that steak dinner and buy you a lot of drinks. Uh, ah, yeah. <laughs> no, you don't have to. That's very generous. Very generous. I do want to find the pilot uh, from that day and uh, and uh, help him out. Now, now, look, you know, I mean, I was just I was just a news guy and covering the Pentagon. 
I, I was given the opportunity. I was invited to have uh, lunch with then Bill Clinton's uh, Air Force Secretary, Sheila Widnall, who had no business being Air Force Secretary, but they're Democrats. You know how they are. And she checked a couple of boxes uh, for them. It was early DEI. And we were having lunch in the Pentagon with the Air Force Secretary. And she said, well, have you ever flown uh, tactical aircraft? I said, no. I said, would you like to? I said, well, hell yeah. And I got to tell you, it was about five days later, we were at Moody Air Force Base getting into, a, into an F-16 and flying away. And, uh, and Marvin, it was one of the great days of my life, one of the great days of my life. I got to tell you. And then yeah. I got to fly an F-18 out of Pax River at the Navy uh, Flight Test uh, Center. And, uh, and uh, it was great. It was a great day. I also, I jumped out of a three, well, I've jumped out of three airplanes. I jumped with the Army Golden Knights twice uh, doing tandem wow. jumps. Um, oh, man. And then my best girl and I jumped with uh, some civilians in uh, Moab, Utah um, on vacation uh, about two years ago now. Um, we jumped, but just tandem jumps, not like Airborne Ranger stuff like you, Marvin. <laughs> Man, but you have had a glorious career. I tell you, I'm I'm kind of envious too. I mean, to be able to fly, always wanted to be able to do that, but uh, no eyesight. So uh, Is that uh, right to do that. So yeah, my eyesight wasn't good enough. So well, jumping I, out of I airplanes, able, you got to be able to see the ground coming at you. <laughs> a lot of times you didn't. <laughs> a lot of times, yeah, at night, night jumps. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I got to do a lot of great stuff. I got to fly an A6 intruder off of the deck of the USS Enterprise three times. Oh, man. Uh, three cats, three traps. I got to drive the USS Enterprise, take the, the helm of the Enterprise and drive them. Got to spend several days on a nuclear submarine, a Los Angeles class uh, nuclear submarine, the Montpelier. Got to drive that too, uh, the Montpelier. Um, up in the up in the sail of the submarine, driving uh, out on the Atlantic Ocean into the sunrise over the Atlantic. Uh, good days at work. A lot of good days at work. Oh my God, man! You you got all the stories. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a lucky guy. I really, and it's uh, all this stuff. Hey, man. You know that any boy wants to do when you're growing up. Obviously, you want to fly fighter jets. You want to fly off of aircraft carriers. You want to jump out of airplanes and ride submarines. And and then I grew up and I got to do all this stuff that any kid would want to do. And I had more fun. I got to tell you, it was, um, CNN had its issues, but my job was a great job. I can imagine that, man, you, you, you've lived a wonder. You lived a wonder life if they would say. That's, That's a fact. Amazing. That's a fact. Marvin, thank, thank you, you for the call. Girl and you're ready to roll. Thank you, my friend. You're ba- I'm saluting you. I'm giving you a, a smart and snappy salute airborne ranger. Uh, Marvin, thank you. Oh, and uh, when we run into each other, you let me know because I owe you the beers, Ranger. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to come up to D.C. sometime soon, and hopefully we can. I'll look forward to it. God bless, Marvin. Great uh, great call. Thank you very much. I uh, And Marvin said he knew O.J. was guilty the whole time. He wasn't one of those people cheering. <laughs> great stuff. Yeah. O.J., that's a, that is, this is a big cultural event. Because O.J. was a huge cultural force and a cultural phenomenon. I mean, the Hertz ads on uh, TV, Run, O.J., Run. And we used to call it, back when O.J. was famous for Hertz commercials, when you got to the airport and you're late for your plane and you had to run through the airport, I'm making like I'm running through the airport now, and you got to run through the airport, it was called doing an O.J. That was called doing an O.J. Then when he cut his wife's head off and uh, murdered Ron Goldman, uh, that was no longer doing an OJ. That's the running through. Oh, you were doing an OJ. No, well, that's not what it used to be. No, that involves uh, decapitation with a big knife. Different thing altogether. Yes, it is. Mm-mm-mm. OJ. Run, OJ, run. Yeah, I have this funny picture of my brother, my brother Patrick with OJ Simpson. Both smiling, having a nice time. Before the murders. Hanging out in California, you know. My brother, he knew everybody. He was very popular. Hanging out with the Kennedys one day and, you know, O.J. Simpson the next day. <laughs> uh, amazing stuff. Yes, sir. Bo Derek, hanging out with Bo Derek. He knew them all. Speaking of communism, 
Who was speaking of communism? Nobody was speaking of communism. Well, we were talking about Democrats. Out of Vietnam, the Reuters news agency reports Vietnam tycoon sentenced to death. It's a woman. Very nice looking woman. Vietnam tycoon sentenced to death in $12 billion fraud case. It's like Bernie Madoff. You know, we threw Bernie Madoff in prison and he died in prison. He stole a bunch of money from a bunch of people. He was a Democrat and almost all of his investors were Democrats. Bernie Madoff. It was another Democrat party scam. A court in Vietnam. You know, this reminds me of the, didn't we just play the Sheila Jackson Lee uh, soundbite about Vietnam a couple of days ago? A court in Vietnam sentenced real estate tycoon Chuong Mai Lan to death over her role in a 304 trillion dong financial fraud case. That is a lot of dongs. How many dongs? 304 trillion dongs. Well, dong is the plural of dong, so it's just dong. That is, according to Reuters, $12.46 billion. And according to the BBC, it's $44 billion. So they're having, they have different, uh, you know, what do they have, those translators? The, the uh, probably got different things. So a financial fraud case, the country's biggest fraud case on record, state media reported, they're communists there, you know. Her trial, which began on March 5th, ended earlier than planned. That happens a lot in communist countries. Was one dramatic result of a campaign against corruption that the leader of the ruling Communist Party, Wen Fu Chong, has pledged for years to stamp out. He's stamping out corruption. Lan, the chairwoman of a real estate developer, Van Trin Phat, and his holding company, was found guilty of embezzlement, bribery, and violations of banking rules. They frown upon that, the banking rules. At the end of a trial in the business hub of Ho Chi Minh City. I call Ho Chi Minh City Saigon. I call it Saigon. And when you go to Saigon, and I've been to Saigon, Saigon, uh, they uh, most people in Saigon call it Saigon too. The communists call it Ho Chi Minh City, and so the American news media calls it Ho Chi Minh City. In fact, I was tell, telling Piercy the other day when I went looking for my old um, eclipse glasses from 2017, I was rummaging all over the house looking for them because we had a pair uh, for me and a pair for my best girl in 2017. Wanted to get them for the eclipse the other day. I'm rummaging around and rummaging around and I couldn't find them anywhere. Then finally, I found them in a, a green bowl that I got in Saigon. I got it in Saigon. It's a cool bowl. It's based on, it's like bamboo strip and they weave and then it's uh, lacquered, uh, uh, bright green lacquer. And that's where I found my, it was in the last place I looked. Because why would you keep looking after you found them? Everything's always in the last place you look. You're looking for something, you find it, you stop looking, don't you? That's why it's in the last place you look. But it was in the last place I looked. So uh, the nice lady, she's going to be executed by the communists in this uh, fraud case. They're going to they're going to kill her. She pleaded not guilty to embezzlement and bribery charges. And and uh, the lawyers, you know, better shut up because they'll execute them, too, because communism. That's the thing. She was sentenced to death for the embezzlement charge and to 20 years in prison for each of the other two charges. So after they kill her, they're going to throw her in jail cell, let her rot for about 40 years because she's guilty, you know. Yeah, there are 84 defendants in the case. They're all getting sentences ranging from three years to life in prison, but they're going to give her death for a financial crime. Boy, they're pretty strict, aren't they? (laughs) How do you kill 100 million people, as the communists have done since 1917? One at a time. Today we have two Vietnams, side by side, north and south. A lot of stuff going on on Capitol Hill today, including uh, news reporter extraordinaire Catherine Herridge testifying on CBS News firing her and seizing her laptops and her files and her records because she had been investigating Democrats and the Biden administration, and that's not allowed. 
and Catherine Herridge and uh, uh, testifying today under oath on Capitol Hill. They call it a journalism, a profession for a reason, because it's about an informed electorate and it's a cornerstone of our democracy. I can only speak for myself. When my records were seized, I felt it was a journalistic rape. Wow. That is gigantic. The headline, Journalistic Rape. Catherine Herridge accuses CBS News of crossing red line during House hearing. You know, we were talking about NPR being corrupt yesterday. And uh, it's not just NPR. As I was saying yesterday, perfectly representative of the rest of the news media, too, with 78 registered Democrats and zero registered Republicans. They give the idea of diversity a lot of lip service, but it's only about race and sexual orientation. And uh, that's it because they're racists and, you know, they're sexually uh, uh, confused, a great many of them. Remarkable stuff. So Catherine Herridge. And uh, also on the Hill today, Christopher Ray, the FBI director, will be testifying about the threat looming the United States and talking about China being the number one threat to the U.S. Chris Ray, what is he doing with his time? I mean, if China's the number one threat, why is he focused on sending FBI agents to the doors of pro-life Catholic protesters, you know, who just want to march for their faith and, and demonstrate peacefully, and he's got SWAT teams showing up at their doors in the morning to terrorize them? I mean, come on. Let's put our priorities where they ought to be. If China's the number one threat, let's start acting like it. Sorry, Senator Josh Hawley. Um... Sticking it to, and FBI Director Christopher Wray deserves to uh, get some sticking to. Why are we sending hundreds of billions of dollars to Ukraine if China is our number one global threat? I mean, these people need to get on the same page here. I mean, let's admit it. If China's the top threat, let's start acting like it. But Chris Ray and the Biden administration, they don't believe it. They're not doing anything to keep America safe. They're out there grinding their political axes and trying to destroy their political opponents. Now, uh, Christopher Ray also warned under oath on Capitol Hill in February about our open border and terrorists crossing over and how we should expect a, like the theater massacre in Moscow recently, we should be expecting a lot of that. But the FBI is busy going after Republicans and Catholics. (laughs) 